everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. Today's video is kind of a, an introduction to a project I'm working on. I want to ask for your help with some advice and some input of what you would like to go into the final project. And that is uh, making a very, um, very broad video going into a lot of depth and a lot of breadth on lanner falcons. Now, if you're uh, subscribed to this channel and watch these videos, I bring lanner falcons up a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's a species that I am incredibly passionate about and that gets glossed over. Nobody ever talks about them, hardly ever. There's, I only know of one book about them and it's, it's, you know, it's a biology book. And, and even though falconers fly them around the world in falconry and in education and in abatement, they're wonderful birds, but nobody ever talks about them. Uh, in areas where they're more readily available, captive bred, they're often viewed as just kind of like, eh, starter bird, not as gamey as a peregrine. And in other parts of the world, like my part of the world, the United States, they're not readily available, so they're very expensive. And because they don't perform uh, athletically quite to the level of, say, a peregrine or a jeer peregrine, then people usually, again, gloss over them. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. So I want to talk to a little bit about the species, introduce them, and, and, and really uh, ask for your input on what you would like to go into the final project. Because the project I've been working on for many months, and I've actually, it's been fun because I've been collaborating with falconers and biologists all around the world, uh, is this project going into depth on lanner falcons. And part of the reason why I, I need the collaboration is not only does nobody ever talk about lanner falcons, nobody ever, ever talks about the different subspecies. And it's a radically diverse in color and with the way they hunt between the subspecies. Because this is a species that from the bottom of Africa to the top of Africa, from the hyper-arid, uh, you know, deserts of the Sahara to Egypt to Italy to, you know, Turkey and Hungary, the, the, the range has waxed and waned over, the, over time, especially since the Ice Age, uh, as we've had different wetter and drier periods. But the range it covers is really strange. We normally think of it as a desert bird, but why I'm really passionate about this bird and where it, it all starts for me is it all starts from Egypt. Now, Egypt is not the oldest civilization, but Egypt is famous because it was so long lived. And even though, and, and they did amazing things like building pyramids and stone temples in an era that's much earlier than any other culture that did so. They were living in mud huts with thatched roofs and making pyramids. So truly a great ancient civilization. And so we look to, the, to ancient Egypt when we talk about math and when we talk about uh, the science and the philosophy and all the things that they pioneered, the technologies they pioneered. So most people have a, a great uh, reverence and respect for ancient Egypt. Well, I've always loved animals. When I was a very young child, second grade, um, I lived in the United States where I was constantly bombarded with images of bald eagles. Bald eagles are large, powerful predators. They're very iconic. You know, but you know, white head, white tail, and brown body. That's really distinct when they're an adult. And that's our national bird. And so you see it on flagpoles. You see it on businesses. You see it all over the place. Eagle, 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 eagle. So that's the first raptor I grew up really knowing was a bald eagle as a little kid. I'd never really heard of falcons yet. And... One day in second grade, I was looking through books and I found this book called The Treasures of Tutankhamun. And it's showing some of the uh, funerary objects that belong to the, pharaoh, the 18th dynasty pharaoh Tutankhamun. And uh, sometimes people call him King Tut, but it's kind of silly when you think about it because his name actually has meaning. But that, when I was reading through this book, I started looking and my, just my whole world opened up to, to ancient Egypt, all the, the beauty of the art, the, the, the amazing artistry of that age, gold everywhere. And uh, in, embedded in, in some of these things were lapis lazuli and obsidian and opal and all these different minerals chiseled out to make feathers in some of these birds. But I remember seeing this picture of a, of a, a pectoral necklace call, of a falcon. And I'm just like, what is this? It just opened my mind, seeing the beautiful detail of this. And I and it's replicated today. I collect uh, lanner falcon art from Egypt, and it's often replicating this famous piece all the way down to the broken onk in each foot is holding an onk symbol, and one of the arms off of one of the onks is broken on the original. And that's always replicated in the art as well today that you see in necklaces. But I started looking everywhere. I started checking out from the library, Egyptian books, falcon, 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 falcon. I started reading field guides. There's plenty of eagles in Egypt. 
there's a number of species of eagles and yet I was just seeing these images of falcons. Why why didn't they why weren't they obsessed with eagles like here in the United States, you know? Think of all the countries of the world that have an eagle as their noble crest, on the royal crest or on their flagpoles. Many countries have that, okay? All over the world. Why a falcon? Why were was Egypt obsessed with falcons? And I started to see it everywhere. I saw it. Uh, I saw that you know the coffin, you know the sarcophagus of the pharaoh would have falcon wings wrapped around, offering protection. And then I started to actually read these books and not just look at all the beautiful images and realize, wow, the falcon was was a god, was a national emblem, was the personification of the pharaoh, and vice versa. And it was it was it was authority. That one of the titles of the pharaoh was the falcon i am the pharaoh i am the falcon and you would see the pharaoh and other uh, important people have statues and images where you would actually have a falcon wrapping sitting on uh, behind them wings uh, around their head kind of showing look this person their glory their authority comes from the falcon it's just beautiful iconography uh you and you even you you see this, even on the famous death mask of Tutankhamun you, everybody looks at his face it's so striking and beautiful the the artistry the craftsmanship but look closely look down over each shoulder and there is a falcon head on each side now being a young child uh, I would also check out little kids books that tone down information they'd say King Tut instead of Tutankhamun and they would and and they would call uh, Horus which is one of the falcon headed gods of ancient Egypt they called him a hawk headed god and I'm like no I've learned what a falcon is he's a hawk not a hawk he's a he's a falcon not a hawk don't call him a hawk headed god and specifically a lander falcon there are a number of falcons in Egypt from as as big as 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 peregrines and, and red nape shaheen peregrines to as small as a number of species of kestrels but it's the lander falcon with its very distinct uh mallard stripe and then double spiral that goes back that was noticed and that was revered the lander falcon and this is really neat when you go into any temple in ancient egypt it's it's an amazing experience. The, the most of the traditional temples, the front will have giant iconic images, and then as you go in, you go through these colonnades, these these column after column, and usually it gets denser and more intimate as you go back in, and you will find statues of falcons. Sometimes it's uh, specifically the god Horus, which by the way, we all say Horus. That's the Greek version. It's Hor, H-O-R, Hor. Uh, but the Greeks added the U.S. ending, and that's what we say today, Horus. But so the god Hor, uh, the falconetic god, was one that was often shown. You see this, you see images all over these temple walls of falcons and of, of a pharaoh associating with falcons. I even would in these books find images of falcons wearing royal crowns, crowns of authority, crowns of divinity. Uh, and, and again, the detail the attention to detail is so spot on, so just absolutely brilliant, beautiful, incredible. And we often think of ancient Egypt in terms of ancient Greece, ancient Rome. And Greece and Rome had their hand ruling Egypt at the very end. There's thousands of years of history before that. Thousands and thousands of years of early Egyptian history, even pre-dynastic Egypt. We see falcons and the icons. And here's what's really neat. Where do we see the authority firmly established? Where do we see falcon is authority, falcon is divinity? The first for sure that we can say it is a artifact called the Narmer palette. There was a pharaoh called Narmer who was the first to officially unite Upper and Lower Egypt, which by the way, Upper Egypt is, is on a map below and Lower Egypt is up above because, well, it, well, yeah, upper lower it's swapped because the Nile flows northward most rivers don't do that uh, so it's kind of so if you're looking at a map it seems strange but the Pharaoh Narmer united violently but successfully united upper and lower Egypt and uh, much of his palace and his origins are destroyed because it's in an area in the Memphis region where it's very wet very marshy uh, and so a lot of things have sunk and have been destroyed over the eons but we have a palette it's called the Narmer palette two-sided a palette is in it has certain makeup that is applied religiously to mimic the falcon you're going to put 
makeup around your eyes to mimic the dark and the malar stripe of a falcon. Now we look at that today and we're like, oh, well, hey, you know, it's just, you know, it's Egypt, it's just the style. It's like, no, it is, it is trying to replicate. It, okay, if, if they worship tigers instead, that will be like putting whiskers and tiger stripes on to be like the divine figure, okay? So this, ooh, ancient Egyptian eye makeup is about trying to appear like the falcon, the lantern falcon. And this Narmer palette, uh, one side of it has the palette section where the uh, makeup was put, and it has two figures intertwined, amalgamated creatures that are meant to represent Upper and Lower Egypt now being united. But on the other side, it has Narmer slaying his enemies in the smiting pose, holding up with the scimitar, doing the smiting pose that got replicated for all the rest of ancient Egyptian history. That same pose, is, is there. And who do you have over here? You have one of his enemies that he's conquered. You have a falcon taking him out. So it's the Pharaoh and the falcon vanquishing the enemies. And the next biggest figure is his right-hand man that is made much smaller over in the distance and with the title, you know, the sandal bearer of the king. He's carrying his sandals after the battle, right? So it's who are the most important figures in Egypt? The Pharaoh and the Falcon. And this is early origins. And, and, and the, the, the craftsmanship of this palette is amazing, but the artistic rendering of those early, early, early first dynasty Egyptians primitive compared to how it became later. And yet, you can already clearly see the falcon, how important it is. It stems from there. These ancient Egyptian temples, eventually the Egyptians kept live ibises and learned the animal husbandry of caring for live ibises in their temples, but also falcons. We don't believe the ancient Egyptians actually practiced the art of falconry, but we know that they were pioneers in how to handle and care for these lantern falcons in the temples, having them on hand at, to, to be cared for as sort of an offering, just living in the presence of temples, adding to the divinity. And again, why not eagles? We don't know, but we know the lantern falcon is where it starts. The lantern falcon is where it stems from above any other falconer. So they weren't looking at, oh, is this bird gamier than a peregrine? No, they weren't looking at that. For whatever reason, the lantern falcon is the bird that captivated the center of their their spiritual thinking. Now, I have talked with falconers. I have flown lander falcons, and I've talked with falconers from all over the world, you know, Africa and, and Europe, Italy and, and uh, Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia, different people who are flying them. And the I, I have to say, I uh, there is some poetic beauty to the fact that of all the people who fly them and work with them around the world, uh, the Egyptian falconers of today, it, just in my personal conversations, seem to be the ones that most passionately fly them and have fun with them. And I love that, that Egypt pioneered falcon husbandry. And now today, Egyptian falconers, they fly many different birds there in Egypt. But I love seeing just how much fun and success and joy they're having with the falcon that kind of started it all. Now, there are, there are, there, this video that I'm working on, we're going to talk about uh, hyperarid uh, Erlangeri lanterns that are almost pure white. We're going to be talking about South African lanterns that are salmon red on the chest, and uh, you know, uh, uh, up in Italy and 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 Greece, those areas where they're white chested with black spots and checkerboards and all kinds of beautiful things. We're going to be going into a lot, and we'll be talking about the falconry, the husbandry, the training, and it's going to be a lot of fun. But because nobody talks about this subject, nobody gets into depth about it, then it's, it's kind of a fun chance to try to address some of these things. So what, why I made this video is to introduce you to the fact, let you know that, that I'm working on it, and because it's a collaborative effort, it's taking longer as I'm getting help and information and firsthand accounts from people around the world of the different subspecies. But I want to, I want to address prehistory, history, biology of subspecies, and falconry. And so knowing that that's what I'm working on, if you watch these videos and you like these videos, please let me know down in the comments what, uh, what, what points and topics dealing with lantern falcons you would like me to address. I've talked in months past about whether or not to do several in shorter ones, and I got more feedback from people saying, no, we'd rather you just do a good one 
and it, it's going to be long. It's going to be very long. But I, I want to do it right, and I'd like to get information out there that that is, is useful, helpful, and interesting to everyone who's following and might have any interest in this species whatsoever. For me too, by the way, I live in the United States. I grew up with long wings, you know, peregrines and and jeers being the thing that we work towards. You know, you start and someday I want to fly long wings. And now what I've seen where the world's becoming so urbanized, people are switching and they don't want to do long wings anymore. And so everybody's doing like micro hawking or like, ah, I'm going to fly a Harris Hawk kind of thing. That's what I'm seeing a lot of. Occipiters, Harris Hawks, Red Tails, and micro hawking, which is fine. In my opinion, the Lanner Falcon can be the in-between. It is a big falcon. And yeah, it's not as gamey or as, uh, as a peregrine or as far ranging as a Lanner, or, or, or sorry, as a Jeer or a Saker. But, but they can be trained to be very loyal and to fly in a tighter area with more success. So maybe they're not... Maybe you're not hunting them from 2,000 feet up. Maybe you're flying them from 300 feet. Kapoo! And you're hunting pigeons and doves and ducks off a canal. So what? It's falconry. And it's a wonderful form of falconry. And so that's part of why I tried to promote this species as well. Because I think it is a great way to keep long winging alive in a way that hasn't really been fleshed out here in the United States. So I hope uh, this little intro is interesting to you. Please let me know down in the comments what topics you would like me to go over in this upcoming Lantern Falcon video and uh, be watching for it here in the coming weeks or months. And if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. It does help me build the channel. And as always, happy hopping.